And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give, him ju give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and I will not give, and I will not, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on the earth. Thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Oftentimes, those words are used by simply because Christians want to say something, but they don't really know what to say. We also don't want to be too overtaxed with actual effort to care for one another. It's much easier to say, my thoughts and prayers are with you and then never think and never pray about the situation again. And if you, I'm not gonna ask, but if I were to ask, who is this true for? Every single one of us would have our hands raised. Thoughts and prayers go out to you as if that actually means something. It doesn't mean anything. Thoughts and prayers go out. And I think that Christians need to understand that words like that, thoughts and prayers are, go out, are not Christian terms. Because thoughts and prayers don't come out of our mouth and then sort of disappear into the ether. They don't, you don't just say, oh, sorry that, you're, uh, that, that you were diagnosed with uh, stage four lymphoma. My thoughts and prayers are with you. And then that doesn't really mean much at all. In fact, I think that we would be better off saying this. I will pray to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that He will be with you and that no, uh, no amount of pain can take you away from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Do you see the difference? Thoughts and prayers can be to any God, to anything, and I don't even know how you would send thoughts out. No, see, when we pray, we pray not like the movie The War Room, where you make a sport out of your prayers, or you make it a sign of uh, commitment to God, but rather, to pray is to enter into battle with Satan himself. We need to know that. When we pray, we are entering into battle with Satan and then we, are, we enter into a wrestling match with God. And I know you're thinking, well, that, I've never heard that before. How is praying like a wrestling match with God? Doesn't he want us to pray? Why would he then wrestle with us as we pray? Well, let's ask Jacob. Because that's exactly what Jacob is doing in our Old Testament text. Literally wrestling with God all night, all day. Finally saying to Jesus, who is that angel, finally says to Jesus, after his hip was put out of place, he says, I will not let go of you until you bless me. God has that desire for us too. That when we come to prayer with him, 
that we grab hold of God and say, I will not let go of you until you bless me and my friend with stage four lymphoma. I will not let go of you. I will continuously come to you. I will be the biggest, uh, 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 the biggest brat, the biggest uh, nuisance that you could ever see because I will not stop coming to you in prayer. And if you're wondering whether or not you can get on God's nerves, I don't know the answer to that question. But I know this, He wants you to try. He wants us to continuously come to Him in prayer. To, and and uh, to prove what I'm saying, we have our New Testament lesson that says this, the widow coming to the city to a man who was a pagan, he was no believer. She would come to him and say, give me justice for my adversary. And though he neither respect or feared God nor respected man, he would say to her, what? Now, keep in mind, this is not a Christian. This is not a faithful Jew. This is not uh, a person who, again, feared God or respected mankind. He cared only for himself. He was the sole uh, a person on top of the food chain who would throw scraps down to his people. Okay, this is not a person that you are to look up to, yet he is used allegorically with God. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Why would a person who is unjust be uh, an allegory to God? Well, we look at uh, the widow who would come up to him and say, give me justice against my adversaries. By the way, that's also probably a prayer that you don't pray very often, but that you should. Because after all, even in the most beautiful Psalms, there are always the imprecatory ones. The ones that we pray that our enemies would be overrun and would be uh, cast out into the sea. But again, we look at our gospel text and we see this. The unjust man, the man who neither feared God nor respected man, gave the widow what she wanted. Not because she was righteous in his sight, but because she was getting on his nerves. That's what the text says. I'm going to give you what, what you want because I know that if I don't, you will not stop coming to me. If I don't give you what you want, you will continuously badger me. Literally, he says, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down with her continual coming. That is, I will not, I will give her what she wants, not only because she bothers me, but she has promised to never stop until she gets what she wants. And I say that because of this. We as Christians, when we come to God to pray, understand that you're not there to beat God into submission, but we are to pray with such conviction that God sees it well to give us what we ask. Now, that means we have to be very, very careful with the prayers that we pray. That's also why gospel, uh, uh, the gospel of getting stuff, as I call it, Prosperity gospel is so wrong. Pray and you will receive. Great, because I'm really broke. I'm going to pray for money. I'm going to pray for a nice car. I'm going to pray for all these things that I really want. Do you see how God would not be inclined to give us such things? Because truly, that's not something to fight for. It's not, it's nothing to fight for. 
But when it comes to faith, when it comes to sickness, when it comes to those whom we love, that God desires for us to grab hold of his robes like the woman with perpetual bleeding who just touched Jesus' robes and uh, her illness went out of her and righteousness came into her through Christ. That's how God wants to, us to approach him in prayer, to grab hold of, his, of the hem of his garment and say, I will not let go of you until you bless my friend with stage four cancer. And what does the text say that we have? An answer. Because what did Jesus do in our Old Testament text? I will not let you go until you bless me. And Jesus did not say, okay, I bet you will. But rather, he blessed him. He did the very thing that, that he so, uh, uh, that, that Israel so willingly wanted. And so he was blessed. His name was changed to Israel, and he became the people of God. When we come to God in prayer, through the intercession of Jesus Christ our Lord, we have to remember, remember, that when we come to Him in prayer, we do not do so flippantly, but rather, we are to be in constant and continual prayer for that which is right on this earth according to Christ. In other words, none of us desire <coughs> sickness, death, or sin in this world. And when it comes to people asking questions such as, why do bad things happen to good people? Or even the opposite of that. I don't have an answer outside of, there are no good people. And that answer, really, it, people will not hear that very well. That won't be received very well. In fact, it's better to just say, thoughts and prayers are with you. That's better than saying, there are no good people. Have a good day. That's not how you go about it. But when you engage in prayer, truly you become St. Luke, who at the foot of the cross petitioned Christ. And Christ looked down to St. Luke and to Mary and said, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. That petition from John, the petition from Mary's heart, was answered by Christ. And so we get down in the mud as well, and we pray that God will bless us, that Christ will bless us. And as we're praying, everything that we think is normal, everything that we think is rational, everything that we think is unanswered becomes answered from that same place. Christ on the cross. His blood drips down as we pray, bless me, bless me. His blood drips down and lands in our mouths. And Christ says, I have blessed you and I will bless you again. You see, prayer has the exact same thing on this earthly plane as it does in heaven. And I will put it to you this way. As we pray on this earthly plane to, for God to be with us and to bless us, He gives us His blood to drink and His body to eat. And by that, He blesses us and our names. But that is but a foretaste of the feast to come. There are many many people that you have prayed for. And again, I want to make sure that I'm very clear on this. I'm not saying that if, if someone gets sick or dies, you have not prayed hard enough. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, rather, is that you grab hold of Christ 
and know that your answer will be that your prayer will be answered in the way that is righteous in a way that is right no one wants to lose a son a daughter a mother a father a child grandparents spouses nobody wants to lose those things and so we can't go to God and say why did you not hear my prayers why did you not listen to what I had to say? Why did you take them from me? The answer is, is this. I blessed them with my blood on earth. And because of that, I bless them now for all eternity. In heaven. So when we pray, we pray this, and this is where you, the wrestling gets real. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's the hardest prayer for us to pray. Not my will, but thy will be done. And it is God's good pleasure to one day bring all of us into himself in heaven. It is his good pleasure that even when we pray and even if we sinfully say, why didn't you hear my prayer and let my loved one stay with me? Even though we may pray that, we have to understand that even if the Lord sustained our loved one's life, it would only be for a little bit. And then He would call all of us unto Him. And so where we want our will to be done, we want our loved ones to stay here with us. I would like to have Grandma Bentley back. But that's sinful. Because it's putting my desires in front of God's. While I might want to have Grandma Bentley back, I wouldn't take her out of heaven for it. And so we have to understand that when we pray, all prayer is a prayer of thy will be done. And no. That the same blood that we are going to partake of today is the same blood they partake of in heaven. And I want to say this, and I want you to listen to me very carefully. Because this text lends itself to this reality. When you come to this altar, when you come to this rail, when you come and you receive the body of Christ and the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and to the salvation of your soul, know this, you do not commune alone. You do not commune alone. Your prayers are answered whether your loved ones are here or are in heaven. You partake of the same blood, the same cup. There are not two churches. There's one church, the church of Jesus Christ. And he gives unto you himself. And so when you kneel, and when I give to you the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and believe me, I know the weight of this. I know how, how, how many, how all of us, many of you and all of us suffer with the way that the world rails against Christians, which is why saying thoughts and prayers are with you is just nonsense. It's just to say, I want this conversation over as quickly as possible because I'm uncomfortable with it. But I say to you this, when I commune you today, when I commune you today, you are not communing with Pastor Mize alone. You are not communing with your family here at Augustana. But on the opposite side of this rail stands your loved one. And I don't mean figuratively. 
angels and archangels and all the company of heaven commune with you. When you commune today, you are but one of many grains on earth and in heaven that is put together that Christ calls his bride and his bread. And he gives you his body as one cup is given to those who believe. So please, listen to these words. If ever you become so lonesome or so hurt because your daughter, your son, your, your spouse, your husband, wife, no matter grandparents, no matter who it is, if ever you miss them and you want to visit them, it is of course wonderful to go and visit in the cemetery and, say, and read the, the uh, history on the tomb. But if you ever want to visit with them, come to the altar, come to church, because while out there you can cast upon the stone, here you cast yourself upon the living stone that is Christ Jesus. And with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven, we all laud and magnify His glorious name. And in that, we don't just get to visit with our loved ones. Our voices are joined together in a beautiful, confession. Christ is Lord. He forgives us of all of our sins. That's the God that you want to take your prayers to. That's the Lord who forgives you of all of your sins. In our epistle text we have this term or this, uh, this statement. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with the complete patience and teaching. So when we come to Christ, we know that by his appearing, his kingdom will come. And so when we pray, the words in which he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you do not know the words to pray, pray those words because they are perfect. Lord, how should we pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And though that, those phrases right there that Christ gives to us, they come together in the Eucharist. They come together in the body and blood of Jesus, given for you, eaten by you, so that you will have everlasting life. And so those of your loved ones who have passed, if they too have consumed and believed in Christ Jesus, God's will is done, for they are in heaven, looking as we commune with us, saying, do not cry, do not weep. I tell you this, it's all true. Christ is risen from the dead. And he gives food to the living and the dead equally. 
So understand this, thy will be done means open and eat. When you commune, you pray. So pray often. Pray at the altar often. Use few words. Just open your mouth. Receive Jesus' body and blood. Go home. Pray, praise, repent, come back. Let's do it again. Amen.